Okay, I think we should be live. I hope we are live. We are a little bit late. Sorry about that. Welcome to the Rollis Present, our second episode of 2020. And as the show dedicated to the tabletop gaming, uh, tabletop role playing community and industry across Europe, what better than have a special episode about one of our nations, Portugal, also known as Lusitania. You are, we have here guests to tell you about everything that is happening all the way from Faro down to the south to Braga up to the north. I looked that up on Wikipedia. Could you each introduce yourself, please? Starting by, with ladies first, Claudia, maybe? Wait, wait, there's ladies in here? Nobody told me? Well, we got a cat lady. Fine. Hi, I'm Claudia. Um, I come from the north. That means I curse a lot, which I'll try to contain during this because we want to be educational, but not in that way. Um, it's I'm interesting well because the north has a very different meaning here in the UK. <laughs> when you said that immediately, I was picturing Manchester. <laughs> but that's north. Um, I've been role-playing for a long time. Um, oh, um, sorry, uh, my connection seems a bit weird. So as I was saying, I've been role-playing for a long time, since 97. I'm a huge role-play uh, fangirl. I run uh, the, the, I help running the Portuguese Discord server. Um, and I've created with my best friend the first game jam the first rpg creating game jam which is rpg genesis from portugal and we've been running for a couple of years now well since 2010 i believe amazing uh, where was i going and i hope we have uh, maybe a few uh, from your discord channel uh, in the chat with us and they, they would have questions or suggestions well, to or things to tell about i told them threats may have been issued maybe hey. not uh, so, I don't know. I mean, I hope so. Otherwise, I'm just going to make their life hell. I mean, I'm going to be very, very sad. But at least, I hope we'll have at least Nuno, who's London-based, and uh, some of you know, uh, to ask some questions. We'll find out later. Daniel, can you introduce yourself? Yes, um, my name is Daniel. I'm a, I'm a writer. Um, I have a couple of books published and a few more on the way. Um, I've been creating tabletop RPG content for uh, both Speculatory and Rubber Chicken and everything about uh, what uh, tabletop RPGs are, writing some reviews on certain games and uh, tips and tricks for both players and uh, game masters. Um, as a member of the uh, uh, in Initiative's team, I created items, classes, races and such for uh, mainly uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, and I'm also broadcasting uh, both my campaigns of Dungeons and Dragons uh, 5e and the Vampire the Masquerade 5e through uh, uh, Roll Initiative's channel. On a more personal note, um, I'm fairly new to the scene. I only have about five years of role-playing games under my belt. Um, and be, uh, beyond some games of my own design, such uh, as Zillu and uh, more recently uh, Deus Vult, um, I've been conducting a study on how useful tabletop RPGs can be for people with autism, uh, depression, and uh, anxiety. On a nutshell, it's basically this. We should get you in touch with you uh, here. Um, he's very into the subject of uh, role-playing games as a, a tool to explore a different, uh, I don't know if that's the right way of calling it, um, uh, mental conditions. Uh, the, uh, remember the name of her, but it is the she most of the time is D I D N D because it's uh yeah she can tell us about that <laughs> anyway uh, Andre final last but least hello hello who are you <laughs> who I who am I that's oh, the that's hard that's the hard question <laughs> so that's the question. I'm Andre. Uh, I'm also new to the RPG scene, like Daniel. I only started playing at 2015. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was a, a wild journey the last two years uh, since I started producing content also at uh, Roll Initiative, which stands for Roll for Initiative. 
Um, I run a show there, which is Role for Diplomacy. I already interviewed awesome designers like uh, Adam, uh, Adam Kobo, Luke Crane, John Harper, and my beautiful idols, the, the family Baker. Um, I'm also the co-owner and co-designer uh, of uh, role-playing game, uh, role games at Mare Baixa, which stands for Low Tide. It's like an indie tabletop game publisher thing um, with me and my peer, Carlos Martins. And uh, yeah, we are making games. Uh, we are trying to make new stuff. We are at this very moment uh, preparing um, a game for the Zine Quest uh, at Kickstarter. And uh, yeah, also, I am also the founder of Rua Lisboa, which is like the Portuguese convention, uh, RPG convention. And uh, yeah, that's basically, I play a lot of games, at least one to three games per week, I try, uh, and I sleep very uh, few amount of hours. <laughs> the interview you mentioned, they are available for people to view and listen in English, I assume, because the, your guests are English speaking. Yes, 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 obviously. If When I have uh, Portuguese guests, uh, which is, uh, like uh, the, the usual case, uh, it's in Portuguese because we are a Portuguese uh, content platform. Uh, our goal is to, to um, engage with the Portuguese community. But, but when uh, we uh, invite an international designer or international host or guest, uh, yes, it's in English. So people can find that on YouTube on the Rola yeah, yeah. Initiativa. Yeah, just roll for diplomacy and you'll find probably Adam Koval video, which is uh, obviously, since he's a, like a online celebrity, uh, it's the, the one with the more views. <laughs> so, yeah. So let's move on in our first question. And we swapped things around following the suggestions from uh, Claudia, which was very good. So mm -hmm. the first question is, how did tabletop role-playing game started, arrived in Portugal? Okay, so... This is the thing you're going to understand about Portuguese role players. We are incredibly resistant to translated stuff. You can't get any translated material in Portugal. You can get Portuguese role games, but you can't get translated. So, and this is, I, I learned this from talking to the people that were there because I came in the second generation of role players. I came in the 90s, late 90s. So apparently role play in Portugal begun with a red box that people would buy outside, like abroad, and then they would bring in. And then the Dungeons would, and Dragons. Yeah, the, the red box from Dungeons and Dragons. And they would just spread it. This was in the late 70s, like 79 early 80s so it started really really early and it was really surprising because from the um, the stories i hear from the older generation that are still some of them are still around uh, they actually mentioned that we were the ones that then imported this into brazil and even though brazil now has a massive rope scene it's like 10 times bigger than ours maybe more it was still us who got rope first and we served as a platform. It was Dungeons and Dragons that started it. The thing is, though, when AD and D started to die and like losing popularity in the night, and that's when Vampire the Masquerade came in full force. That's basically what happened in the night. The second generation was mostly World of Darkness. Here, it was played mostly World of Darkness. It was played mostly by um, university students like myself. Uh, whereas by comparison, the people in the first generation, they actually were all people already with their own families and uh, disposable income. So there's not the thing that I see happens a lot in England where really young children start playing D&D in school, like 16, 15, you're already playing it. Here, there is this thing where we do seem to be older there is not a lot of young role players to be a bit on the t up to 20 and above. And um, D when, when Vampire the Mask dropped them, people were a bit younger. We were all in our early 20s. And then D&D &D returned in force, but it, then it started to spread. It, it, it's different in the area where you... Were because I know that in Porto, in the north where I am, Pathfinder became incredibly popular. 
like it was the only played game until D and D fifth edition came through. Like fourth D and D fourth edition still had some popularity, but a Pathfinder like basically owned it. I'm not sure how it was in the rest of the country, though. I'm not sure how things were in, for example, Lisbon, which is the capital of the south, and it's the biggest city. Um, but here, it was like Pathfinder was the unbeatable foe. And then 5th edition hit recently, and then suddenly everyone's playing it, and we constantly, in the Discord channel, get new and new people going, oh, I just found out about roleplay, I want to play D&D. So a lot of people don't even know there are games that are in D&D. It's interesting uh, because what you describe of the 90s is the experience I went through and which I assume to be everybody's experience before I started the this podcast and I started interviewing people because in the French-speaking world in France and Belgium, I assume in Switzerland, uh, uh, the, yeah, the bankruptcy of TSR created this space for other games to populate and when i played it was indeed world of darkness which was extremely popular and it was something for uh, teenagers and 20 something and it had a very different vibe that the sort of stories i hear from the uk when uh, it, it makes sense when you think about it that of course in the uk children can read dungeons and dragons why in belgium and france it has to be translated it's not always the case uh, and so on so so yeah, it makes total sense, but it's just, we, we never had this discussion. Uh, Andre, Daniel, is it, uh, does that reflect your experience of the, the community? Yeah, well, uh, uh, since I'm, uh, well, my, my playing spot is the Lisbon, although I do not live in Lisbon, I live near it. Uh, but today I'm actually near Faro, uh, which is kind of crazy. So we, we, uh, we have, pl uh, we are uh, reaching from uh, por uh, South Portu Portugal and North Portugal. But uh, yeah, regarding the role playing, the starting of the role playing, I think I do. I yes, I know that we had one translation, only one, since the, the very beginning, a red box at eighty nine or eighty seven. I can't remember it, uh, quite well. Uh, but yeah, uh, the, at Lisbon, Pathfinder is famous, but not as so so much famous like uh, in Porto. Um, and yeah, Dungeons and Dragons rules uh, everything. Uh, but I do believe that's the case in ev everywhere in the world. So, uh, but now we are, it's changing somehow, it's changing. But that, yeah, that's uh, for later questions, I believe. <laughs> Apparently in Germany, uh, the Zwart Ogre, the Black High, is still ruling over the land because it's taking quite a, a while for yeah, tradition true. to be translated to, to German. I, I've heard that there's been some issues with the translation of fifth edition in Portuguese. In Portuguese as well, especially in, in Brazil, something which got cancelled. Uh, I remember, I guess you went through that also, that we had a weird situation when, with French when uh, Wizards said there would not be any translation, but they did the SRD or GL, Open Gaming li li Guild license or whatever, and, and local publishers rushed doing a version of 5th edition nationally mm -hmm. in their language. Uh, kickstarted then and uh, by the end of the kickstarter that's when it was revealed that there would be a translation in french spanish and so on and it created a number of issues i mean I, i'm doing a doing a, you see claudia you were saying that we would go travel on the side travel i'm doing exactly the same it's perfectly fine i understand your pain also we're not going to get any translation because it probably won't sell really yeah. Oh god, yeah. Like we like our role play pure. Um, yeah, we we don't like seriously. Um, we, what does it you mean? Won't find yeah. It means no, no. This is because I used to have when I was in in high school. I used to have a translation uh, subject, like it was English translation techniques. It was like literal curriculum, and my English, the was also my English teacher. Uh, and used to say to me and everyone that translation is betrayal and we have to accept it. And apparently we Portuguese do not take betrayal or playing games because we only take them in the original language. Unless it's French, uh, then we might actually accept it. Uh, the only case I know of is um, Shadows of Esteran, which I think got translated to English. Cool. Game. Wow, nice. 
But, the, but wait, I the, never just... bought it because it's dark fantasy and I do not like fantasy. <laughs> well, just a, a little clarification I will ask from uh, you three then. So from what you're saying, does that mean that the, the sort of uh, language landscape of Portugal is similar to, let's say, the Netherlands, where people, most people are bilingual. They, they, most people have a decent mastery of English, meaning that you don't really need often translation of stuff from Dutch okay, to so English because people just speak English fluently. It's yes often. and no. Look, we don't dub things. In television, uh, dubbing is just for children. You only get dubbed television if you're a child. And even when I was a little girl, cartoons were all subtitles. Okay? You can go to the movie and 90% of the movie are are not dubbed, are subtitled. It's so like the Netherlands. Have a, so yeah, we have a lot of exposition, but we're terrible in, in general. And I say this as a, a former English teacher. Like, well, I mean, we're decent. Like compared, I don't know, Spain, um, that seem to have a bit of a trouble acquiring new language. But yes, we do, we do have that comfort of dealing on a daily basis with a foreign language. So we, I guess that's why... And also, it's cheaper for us to get role-playing games in their original language. So I guess that's also we're, we're cheap. Well, I'm we're poor, but sure. Um, and I think that's why one of the many reasons why we tend to prefer things, role-playing games, in their original language. Except if it's French, because French is really hard. So, Daniel, what do you think of that? I mean... Um... Translations, yes, uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's a topic for uh, a really hot debate, and um, like uh, both Claudia and, and uh, uh, Andres said previously, uh, we are comfortable if we, um, content that comes from uh, its original uh, original source, and it, uh, when it comes to role playing and uh, GMing and DMing a session. Uh, we tend to, and uh, I speak uh, on my own experience, we tend to blend languages. Um, when uh, uh, I'm GMing a session of Dungeons and Dragons and uh, I ask uh, some uh, player to make an insight check, I say insight. I don't go for the Portuguese version of the, uh, of the word. And um, uh, I mean, when, it, when we go to the subject about uh, dubbing and uh, subtitles, uh, yes, only cartoons and uh, more uh, animated movies focus on children uh, in the, in the dub being dubbed. And even when it comes to dubbing, uh, the voice actors that we, we have, uh, when it comes to roster size, are very low when, it can, when comparing to other countries like Okay, I'm going to be a little extreme here, but Japan. So, so yeah, uh, if we, uh, when it comes to the origins of everything, yeah, Dungeons and Dragons, of course. And uh, we only had one translation, like Andrea, I can, I can pinpoint the, the date, uh, but it was a translation of the Red Box. Uh, I know that uh, right now, I believe they cost a fortune to acquire. Um, but yeah, we don't really bother with translating stuff since uh, we are comfortable with reading the original content. So we brought, we discussed that a, a tiny bit already, but would you say that, I don't know, if you were traveled a bit, maybe seen some streams from the US or the UK or other countries, do you feel that there's a, uh, Portuguese way of playing role-playing games. What are you the most? What are most players a lot into? I, I hear there's a lot of Pathfinder. Does that mean that Portuguese players like tactical things, uh, or are they more into the role-playing, uh, which I know is the case for the French ones? Well, so if there's a, a, a an actual way uh, of playing role-playing games as a Portuguese, well, it's it's really there, yeah, there is. We all play with a pastel nata, you know, <laughs> uh, near us. Yes, we throw dice and we uh, take a bite, and then we throw. No, no, that doesn't happen. <laughs> but we grow a mustache uh, before playing. 
And yeah, oh, you got the chicken, like flattened, <laughs> and uh, the sardines. Oh, beautiful sardines. No, no. There is like a specific way. There are things that I would like to pinpoint that happens to me and I see happen at least in the Lisbon community, which is um, what Dan Daniel said, and it's very, very true. Like uh, you, you use the English words, uh, it's the English mannerisms uh, uh, all the time. And sometimes the Portuguese word blends with the English one and it creates a new uh, one, uh, even if it is not correct, gr grammatically correct. And um, yes, it's, and it's even weird for most or some players uh, saying some words in Portuguese, like chainmail. I was uh, uh, playing Dungeons and Dragons. I said chainmail in Portuguese, which is quite a malha. And my fr my players uh, cringed at the word. And they said, and they said to me, don't, oh, don't, don't, don't say that. Please say chainmail, the actual English word. Uh, so yeah, we we play with a lot of English mannerisms um, in Lisbon. Uh, now, there isn't so much Dungeons and Dragons at the role-playing meetings uh, and conventions. There is a resurgence or at least a surge of a new wave uh, of new games being designed uh, because of last year, 2019. And, um, but yeah, we, don't, we are not weird. We don't play with sardines and pastel blue. <laughs> well, it, it goes contrary to what I'm being told in the chat room. Uh, Sanguinia, I think, is confirming there's always Bacalo. And uh, everything Asado, which I'm not sure what that means. Uh, I was wondering, does that mean that you don't have words for things like Beholder or Illicit oh, or Tarask? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Rask, it was it's a name? So you wouldn't translate it, but for example, beholder is like a pun in English that we don't have it in Portuguese. Like the closest we have to the eye of the beholder is who loves the ugly, finds it beautiful. So no, no, we don't. No, we don't. I got a pun and in French. Also, Actually, also, also yeah. I have a bit of information for you like this. The thing we do, and I also do that, which is shifting Portuguese and English, is called switching. And it's proved it, it's actually good for your brain and it actually sets off brain uh, the, the diseases for five years, like, um, oh, what's it called? The one that starts with an A. Um, like, by uh, the, the problems you get from age, it keeps your brain proper fit. So it, it sets off like, makes it take takes five years from your brain just doing that make it l less likely to get um Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's yeah like five years later and it's proof this, the scientists have tested that so it's good keep doing that good, yeah, yeah. Okay, awesome, <laughs> awesome. Uh, I right. actually had a, a quick question because I, I found out through my show that uh in most languages there's no word for role player even 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 in English, it's not really used, and French for that was kind of unique because somewhat did. Uh, I'm not sure if it was Didier Gisex, may have been somebody else, but he created the word "rollist," which means a role player. So, do you have a I mean, we, word for "rollist" in uh, in Portuguese? We could cheat. We could just call it "rollista," which is take because Portuguese is so similar to French, but it doesn't yeah. make much sense. So, but theoretically, we could call ourselves "rollistas." But we we don't we actually call ourselves role players like the the online community and the communities uh, in every place like it's the group of role players of the, of Lisbon like uh, we at actually at most the, yeah yeah, yeah at Lisbon, most be um, players of role play like yeah. sometimes I say I am a player of R. But yeah. there was yeah, one you person, were, oh, sorry no problem there was one person that uh, tried uh, a couple of years ago to make uh, the new word, meaning role players, which uh, Claudio is very near uh, to him, which is jogador sonhador. And I know that he tried to make uh, the, the words uh, jogador, which is player, and sonhador, which is dream, like dream up player, or dream players, like the our Portuguese way of saying role players. But it didn't quite stick, so it's his nick. <laughs> I remember asking even, role-playing game and I found Jogo the Interpresao, but I had people sending me message telling me actually it's not really used. No, uh, no, it, 
at this moment we are trying to stick with the jogo narrative which is like a narrative game um it's the best take we are trying to to stick in the community yes some people, yeah. some daniel you were fight. saying sorry daniel you were trying sorry. to speak a bit earlier um uh, about the the name of creatures and something uh, and we had a conversation a few years back with a friend of ours Juki Martins about the problem with the problems and the, uh, and such related to translations and uh, when it comes to literal translations um, there was there, there came the example of the mind flayer which in portuguese will stand for esfolement um and it was an interesting reaction and uh, uh, praise the heavens that uh, such kind of translations do not exist. Okay, so that was hilarious and I also never want to hear it again because my mind is now flayed. That is a horrible word and you should be ashamed of yourself. It's so anyway. interesting because you, you seem to, I mean, uh, the the French they, they have this culture and it's even politically enforced of protecting French as a language because it, it's feeling under threat so it's very important to have French words for English stuff and sometimes it's enforced by government into completely ridiculous ways like in business management you've got terms which or even an email personally I like it they translate the email to courriel for courrier électronique but shorten and stuff like that so it's very important for the french in general uh it's interesting to hear that for the portuguese it's it's a bit uh, again it reminds me of the dutch we can't be asked seriously i think that's just it I, we can't be asked now in an attempt to bring this back to the original um pie i was going to mention that again i haven't enough in other countries to know if they're really different from Portugal to the point that there is a Portuguese to do things. But the one I've noticed is that um, role playing is a community hobby or where you gather with the people you don't know and you talk about role play and you play with them is something that is a very recent turn of events in Portugal. Because until that recently, Portugal was like something you did with your mates, like poker night. You did it with friends, people you really know. Um, I, that's how I met some of my best and oldest friends, like, uh, AKA Gamer Dreamer Man. Um, in England, I've known that people just create groups and say, look, we have a community of rope, we gather players, you come over and pay a small fee, and then you can sit at the table with strangers and play with them. And in Portugal, that didn't happen it's that you have a very small fixed community a group of friends that roll it together they probably shift around who was game mastering some of some of the times you did it at the same time like when i was in in college uh i game mastered and played in the games of all of my friends at the same time so i used to play like five times a week um and that is something that i've never seen happening in any other country that i know of it does seem to have this whole very community feel like you don't know this person but you can go to a, to a convention and sit and play with them and that only started to happen here very recently and even there, there's still not a lot like there I, I know like my current group it's only part of it that is contact with the rest of the community of role players. Most of them just go, no, I don't care about the rest. I don't, I don't give a um, thing. <clears throat> um, yeah, I don't care. Uh, and that's why it also becomes really hard for you to give a proper census of what happened in Portugal, who, what genres uh, people like, what is the, the, the gender of the players, ages. It's really hard to determine because there are hundreds of these tiny, tiny, tiny groups, self-nations, don't contact with each other or the rest of the world. The only point of connection is like usually the oldest player or the... Uh, usually those are the ones that go forth and talk to other game masters and, and all of that. But other than that, like uh, there's these, these proudly alone community of gamers that 
you don't know and you can't ever know unless you become their friends. That actually ties in a bit to a question from Nuno. Hello, Nuno, uh, of proudly London-based uh, Portuguese player. He was asking, what changes have you seen over the last, let's say, few five years uh, in the Portuguese community? Do, do you see that sort of uh, uh, dramatic impact and positive impact from something like Critical Role? Or do you see an influx of young players thanks to fifth edition? And, and uh, yeah, is, is these things which you are describing starting to change in any way? It, it's really hard to say because, again, I think Portugal is becoming a two, a two type country because on the one hand you do have this influx of people who come in and they watch strange things and they see a Rick and Morty and they go, oh, there is D&D. And they also have this weird notion that D&D is role play and they know nothing else until we come to them and we'll hammer them, no, there are other things. At the same time, you have these lonely city-states of role play these small focused groups that um, just play whatever the game master wants. Like, he wants to be experimental. We're going to play, I don't know, Inomine, the original French one, and people will play. And that's what I did. I role play a really lot of weird things when I was starting to role play. Uh, but it's, it hasn't so much as changed as it became sort of like two side by side currents. They never meet except in certain cases, like for example, myself, I am very community oriented. I deal with a lot of people. I have role played with Andre, I have game master Andre, uh, but I know people in my group that I have to like force them to come to the school and they will not participate because they just don't know and they just don't care. They want their little group. They're happy in their little group. So you kind of will have both. I mean, both best of both worlds, I guess. The sort of two parallel words are things we also have in the UK, to be honest, especially the, you got all the critters, uh, they are very active and even active in convention and cosplay and this sort of things. But they, they go at conventions like MCM Comic Con, uh, where you got the anime and all this stuff, all this stuff. I, I love it's not uh, a question, uh, uh, I'm not judging anything. But then you got the convention, conventions of gamers, which already that's not, a lot of people stay on in their group and never meet anybody else. But those are two separate worlds. And right this year, we've got Critical Role coming to MCM Comic Con on the same weekend as UK Games Expo here. On one hand, a few people I know were like, oh, it's the same date, it's a conflict, which one I'm going to go to? But on the, on the other hand, on the wider spectrum, the Venn diagram doesn't really overlap because critters don't go that much to UK Games Expo. And people who awesome. go to UK Games Expo are not that much in critical role, most of them. Also Daniel weak. and Andre, maybe, <laughs> sorry. Very sorry weak, to... because there are going to be threes there, and besides, critical role came already to MCM Comic Con the other, like last year, so they'll come back, like go to go to Games Expo, it's great. <laughs> awesome. I mean, they, can, they can listen to the release podcast, we went to MCM Comic Con, recorded critical role there, and Chris's. Both and, uh... are three days, three days, like you can just travel, and it's like, Two us by trade from from London to Birmingham, and, and I know that because I do it every year. Every year I come through London to Birmingham, so yeah. Respect. So Daniel and Andre, the, do you see that in the the communities you're? I mean, yeah, in? you you need to talk about the critical role effect, and um, uh, in my case, that's the reason why I started ro role playing. I came into, into oh, contact. Really? Wow. Uh, I came into contact with uh, Dungeons and Dragons, of course, because it's Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, boo, course, boo, Claudia, uh, with me. Boo, you don't have to stop boo. with Dungeons and Dragons. In the mini Satanist, Nephilim, Vampire, the Masquerade. Shame on you, shame on your cow, shame on your family, shame on your wife. Yeah, yeah. It's I nice. We got the we got the schism <laughs> right here. <laughs> I take all the shame. I don't care. I no, take, no, I, don't, I, I don't, don't, my, don't, don't, don't. I take it as my own. Uh, but uh, uh, that's uh, that's the thing. I came uh, into contact with it uh, through um, a YouTube channel. I can't remember the name, uh, and it was um, a single episode that was separated into three videos. Uh, and I watched the three, I, I watched the three of them just out of curiosity. I was hooked, and I and I was like, I wanted more 
So Google did, did its magic and uh, introduced me to Critical Role. I started watching. Uh, and I was like, yeah, this is this is the the idea of of role playing game that I really wanted to implement. It was like it was like uh, I came from a, I came from a background of um, video games. I started playing video games uh, since I was five, um, and uh, games like uh, Arx Fatalis, um, Skyrim, uh, Dragon Age, and stuff like that with character creation and customization uh, and everything and all those aspects that I love. Um, I saw Dangerous and Dragons and I was like, so you telling me that if I can imagine it, it simply exists. Oh, and um, since, uh, since where I come from, uh, no one knows what this is and those who do, uh, do so because of uh, conversations with me and there is no interest in playing. Uh, it, it took me uh, one full year to have my first gaming session um, and I've been playing uh, since, uh, since then, those five years that I mentioned before. And yeah, you, you need to mention Critical Role, you need to mention Dungeons and Dragons and that's one of the reasons why when you go to Discord channels and uh, RPG groups, uh, uh, the, the new players come asking for Dungeons and Dragons and the group uh, in, in their local area uh, that uh, play Dungeons and Dragons. And uh, then there is uh, the two parties, the two sides of the coin, where uh, you have one side that goes, yeah, you can join my group and I, I'll show you the ropes uh, and we can have, uh, we can have some, some fun together. And you had the, the other side of the kind that, that goes like, Dungeons and Dragons, really? You should play this, 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 and this. Dungeons and Dragons, no, that's a big no. Uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm guilty of that. I mean, I try to come across as uh, not negative, but the- uh, You just you know, did, did it to me. Yeah, I did it, I did it, I did it. I, 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 I'm guilty, as I'm saying, I'm guilty. I'm guilty. The thing is, to, to, in my uh, not quite defend is, uh, it's 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 a bit weird how, as a player of other games, um, you got this uh, message coming online, which is so intense from the D and D community, and it's always about D and D, always about its feats, about turning John Wick into a fifth edition character, and so on, and it's very tough. When you're like, well, you could try Feng Shui too. It would be a bit better for for John Wick, and it's it, it's difficult to come across not as a uh, horrible snob, uh, even when you're not uh, trying to uh, make uh, despicable jokes like uh, I just did. Andre, to finish the the topic of the evolution of the community in Portugal, anything to add before we move on, on to our next question? Well, we can uh, we can add that um, we don't feel that if uh, that difference you feel there regarding creatures and uh, role-playing uh, community there isn't such one at least for, at, at least now like uh, we don't have a, a, a even a one creature creature group uh, at uh, facebook or whatever social platform there is well here's because, your call you need to start one yeah but, but they, they are already blended with the with the role-playing community itself okay it's like, cool so uh, it's really okay to have critters with robots there isn't such difference like uh, uh, here in portugal you don't say oh that's a critter and that's a role player you see uh, we don't have that difference here and that's quite good and bad i don't know but well it it it's doesn't really good. yeah it, it might start uh it's not enough of you it would be like look at that guy over there look at that oh, girl no. over there. there's two of them <laughs> no no we don't have it hopefully we we will not uh, ever uh, have, uh, have that difference <laughs> we've got a uh grn mariano saying that they had a creatures meetup in rolisboa mm -hmm. that's weird True story. so yes, moving it. on into the next question uh is there such thing as portuguese flavored uh, role-playing games and the best way to address that um well, what are your who are your favorite RPG authors from Portugal? 
and I had someone, uh, I cannot find back the, who it was, but in the chat who was asking, are there any uh, Portuguese role-playing games which were exported uh, somewhat successfully uh, to, to English nations? Um, I know of only one case where that happened of a pure Portuguese uh, role-playing game that was, uh, oh, I don't remember the name. It's a pure, uh, it this was, word it, comes it, back. Yes. The pure Portuguese experience. Yeah. No, when I mean pure, I mean simply in the sense of it was written by Portuguese, it was created by Portuguese, it was, well, it published, it was self-published by Portuguese people. Um, it was okay. a fan, yeah, it was rather kai. Uh, yeah. It was uh, a guy from um, who I believe lives in Lisbon right now, and one of my friends uh, helped them in the in the endeavor. And it's a very steampunkish uh, meets D and D fantasy. And in the it it was published in the traditional way, only in the sense of it was very thoroughly uh, illustrated with wonderful art, and it was published in a five hundred page book. Um, but it was all paid by him. So it, it's not so wow. much it got published, but it's in English. And being in English is possibly one of the few that you could theoretically buy. I mean, you can get more, but they're all very indie in, in style and flavor. Uh, that's the only case I can remember. It was like a few years ago. And it was it, it's very traditionalist in that sense that it's great production values, a big book, lots of art, and in English. I, I don't think it was ever published in Portuguese in any shape, form, or form. Hmm, interesting, wow. So, Daniel, any favorite author? Uh, I mean, uh, since I really didn't try many games, both international and national, uh, I can only pinpoint two names for di two different reasons. Uh, the first one is a friend of ours, uh, Bruno Ribeiro, that created the Na Floresta. You can translate it into, into in the in the forest, which is a one-page RPG, really simple, that uh, oh, cool. is focused uh, on uh, on kids, and it, it's about uh, animals in the forest having a little adventure. Uh, it's really simple and um, more than fulfilling its uh, its goal into um, being really really fun and interesting for the uh, for the target group the target audience kids uh, it also is a, a really cool game to introduce uh, new players into into the genre instead of just going uh, okay i i want to i want to try uh, role playing games uh, here's the player handbook the danger master's guide and the monster manual uh, maybe okay there is this one this single page we can uh, we can start here, and it's amazing. Uh, the other one uh, is João Mariano, that uh, was already uh, already mentioned here before. Um, we've been talking recently because uh, both World of Darkness um, and uh, um, uh, both my uh, my Vampire Masquerade campaign and a new game that um, uh, and a game that I've been making the the most recent one. Uh, and we were uh, sharing impressions and uh, uh, and uh, and the like, and and I came into uh, a game that he made a few years back called uh, called uh, Cidade Obscura, uh, Obscure City, if, if you want to go to translate it, which is basically his take uh, into the the world of darkness, and um, uh, it's a, a neck of a neck of a, another hack. Uh, and uh, the result is a very simple game uh, that uh, you don't really need to study 25 or uh, some 25 or plus years of lore in order to get the setting right. Uh, and the, since about the, the flavor aspect of the of the question, I can I can name Andre and uh, his work about uh, converting adapting creatures from Portuguese folklore. Um, and uh, uh, some episodes of our uh, history into uh, the format of uh, Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. Andre, tell us about that. <laughs> oh, I've been hooked. 
Damn. So yeah, I have a project uh, regarding that show, uh, Role for Diplomacy. One of the guests was a um, Portuguese writer, and he published a, a book uh, with the title uh, "Traditional Portuguese Bestiary," and it was it's a kids book with monsters from our folklore, not like the fantasy or the mythic mythology, mythology um, but uh, from the folklore itself, from the popular uh, uh, stories that um, spread of, uh, of generations from in other, uh, from uh, since uh, those stories to, you tell to scare your kids, mm -hmm. uh, don't go around the pool, don't go around the, the, the well. water well, yeah, Some, something will come uh, grab you and uh, take you take you down into the abyss and uh, hit you. Yeah, and uh, after that episode, I decided, okay, I will start uh, a new show, which was Monster Monday. Every Monday, I desi I design um, a creature uh, from the Portuguese folklore uh, and um, created a Portuguese uh, monster sheet. Uh, I was trying to make it all in Portuguese. And it was a pain in the fucking ass, freaking ass, <coughs> in the fucking ass because. Too late. Uh, yeah, the uh, uh, words. For for listener, a freaking ass is a <laughs> is a Portuguese dish. Yes, it's a Portuguese word. <laughs> so it was really hard because uh, sometimes in the stream uh, we spent like uh, ten minutes uh, talking about a word, and uh, yeah, it was really. Uh, but it was nice. Uh, at this moment, the project is uh, in standby. But yeah, um, this year it will um, go. Um, rest uh, I will restarting the project and hopefully finish it. Hopefully. Cool, amazing. Uh, for people watching us, or videos swapped around, that happens. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's <laughs> it. And it's gonna <laughs> remain like this for the rest of the show. So. Uh, uh, Claudia, you Andre now, and uh, uh, Daniel, you Claudia. But uh, uh, I think we've got we've got a Marianne, uh, a J Mariano in the chat room. So is that actually Joe? That's me, Joan. Joan. Wow. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Thank you so much for joining us. We need to to record an episode with you uh, in the future. Yes, uh, you need. side note, uh, I've been asked by someone, uh, a publisher, I won't say who, for authors from different countries uh, across Europe, potential authors to contribute to a Call of, not, not Call of Cthulhu, a Cthulhu project, a uh, Lovecraft project. So if you are a writer from Portugal or any European nation and you're interested to write Cthulhu adventures and you've got experience, please do send me uh, an email. I certainly cannot say more. Uh, it's not something robust, but I've been asked if I knew any people, and I would be very, very happy to get in touch with who asked me for such people. Claudia, I don't think you had this favorite author to tell no, us about, did you? So <laughs> I'm going to tell you that that person, that my favorite Portuguese author, would be Ricardo Tavares, aka Gamer Driven, Jusnador. I will warn you in advance, though, he is also one of my best and oldest friends, which means I'm not exactly the most unbiased of sources. Still, he's been gaming and role playing for almost as long as I have, like only a couple of years difference. And, um, he has this huge passion for the theoretical side of games, just going from game theory to gaming design and even design in general. Uh, we are very, very similar as like as as authors in, of games. I do it because it amuses me. He he does it because he's really good at it. Um, in that we're both very, very whimsical and sometimes like madly experimental when we're creating RPGs. But unlike me. Um, I have this and the kitchen sink approach to RPGs. He, everything he does is incredibly polished, incredibly clever, even knowing that his most weird mental stuff. Uh, to me, he's has, he is hands down the best, most interesting role-playing game author in Portugal because whether he's doing hacks from other games or creating his own games from scratch. More importantly, and this is really good, if he likes you, you're going to get your own role-playing game for Christmas. I got a Cyber Generation hack wow. Monster Hearts, and it's the best thing ever. Like, best thing ever. He needs to, to find someone to translate his work. Let, let me take a note. Yeah. 
Yeah, Ricardo is fucking You do know what cyber generation is, right? Cyber generation is like that teen oppression spin off teen drama in Cyberpunk 2020 setting, and then it became its own game. And he actually did a hack of that for, for Monster Heart, so which is amazing. Amazing. Neatsel, who's taking care of the engineering here, managed to put us back in place. Uh, thank you so much, Neatsel, for dealing with that. So all the people you mentioned, do would you think they have something in common? Uh, is there something you find which is common to authors and publishers from Portugal? Uh, first of all, the love for the role-playing games and the love for creating stuff, uh, both adapting or creating something uh, from your own blood, sweat and tears. Uh, and the other um, would be, since there is no official way of publishing your work, uh, everyone goes indie. Uh, platforms like Patreon, Itch.io, um, DriveThruRPG uh, tend to be the main source for letting your work uh, letting your work be public, in uh, in so to speak. Yeah, and th th there's also like um, um, regarding the publishing thing, the the common aspect, uh, at least some years ago, was like you have you have games made by Portuguese authors and designers, indie ob obviously, and all there are like dozens of games and they are all somewhere in Google Drives or folders lost somewhere uh, in the internet. And uh, yeah, it was a thing that, that I tried to make, like people going into Ichu because it's an awesome platform and uh, trying to show their work at a platform. We don't, do, we don't use drive-thru yet so uh, too much. But yeah, at least we are tr starting to have new people showing up on Ichu. And I'm trying to now hook my favorite author. Okay, can I reel, reel back? Uh, we already mentioned uh, uh, Ricardo Tavage, which is awesome. Obviously, it's a really awesome uh, designer and role player. He has uh, what is for me um, maybe the best Portuguese um, RPG content podcast, uh, uh, about RPG theory and game design. But uh, I have to say another name, which is also a very close friend of mine, uh, João Mariano, is at this very moment, uh, at least from five years or four years ago, designing um, a, a role-playing game, uh, Heróis Modernos, which stands for More Than Heroes. A role-playing game about, cre about the creating a comic uh, of superheroes. Now, what is, uh, I already play tested it uh, at least uh, two or three times. Um, oh, by the apocalypse, I think you said. Yeah, it's somehow, it started with, uh, I think it started with Fate. Then it shifted to PBTA, powered by the apocalypse, but now it's its, it's, its own uh, design. Oh, cool. And, uh, yeah, yeah. And the beautiful detail about the game is that, and probably he already notices it, and that, and this is why it's so hard to write a freaking game. Uh, it's because the game is played in like a two-player perspective, not in the first player, not in the third player. Uh, so you don't play it in the actor stance. You don't always play it in the outer stance of the role-playing games. You have a very unique uh, perspective where you play the superhero created in the comic but from the point of view of the artist of the author oh so you got the fourth so you got the fourth world you're atop the fourth world to uh, it's, name it's one really, of my favorite uh, youtubers it's really weird it's... yeah it, it's really weird because uh, it really work it works um in any way you play it, you can play it in actor stance and in outer stance. It works in both ways. But the way that your mind eye um, creates the imaginary uh, uh, the imaginary elements um, is from the point of view of the artist, of the author. But your decision making is to the superhero inside the comic you are creating. So it's, it's a meta thing that somehow works and it's beautifully designed. Uh, it's diceless and it's awesome. And hopefully finish the game this year uh, or I'll be very mad at him. <laughs> you better because I have Death Note and I, I'm not afraid of using it. 
Uh, oh, that's good, good, good one. If you have a death note, uh, I've got some <laughs> British politicians. Uh, I got a list. I need to let, send me, let me just grab it. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, I was just about to say, uh, uh, Nuno mentioned dragon meat uh, in uh, here. I think in terms, I know Spiel is a big convention, uh, Expo is a big convention here in the UK, but really for for role playing games, my personal, I'm not uh, objective with that. It's her, my hometown, but dragon meat here in London for me is the best in terms of strictly role playing games. And uh, if I could just make a little call to the authors in the chat room, the authors among you and your friend, I would really recommend banding together and trying to come as a group to Dragon Meet this year uh, in the uh, end of November, early December. Uh, I'm sure we could facilitate something uh, with the organizer. You could get a booth together or maybe I'm um, just throwing ideas like that. There's the UK in the RPG League, which is already something about banding together small authors. I think I think they could be very welcoming, and I would be really awesome if uh, some of you uh, would be interested in showing up and uh, networking with all the amazing publishers who attend the event. So, uh, someone is I, I don't remember. I too uh, had a question. Sorry, you were saying go go ahead. Uh, where yeah, I would say let's do it. Let's just go uh, there. Yeah. I was I was planning going at Dragon Meet and then Thailand uh, happened. So yeah, <laughs> if you have come to, to Games Expo, come <laughs> in Expo. Okay, I'll go. I'll go. I'll go. <laughs> yeah, I'll but there. we got to be there. Be there. I'll okay. be there. Be there. Actually, it's a good segue for our final section of, of the show. Portuguese RPG conventions. Where is the fun to be had? Polish boy. <sighs> but that makes sense. Can, we can start earlier than Rolly's Boy. There were uh, some conventions with role playing games that Claudia can surely talk about it. Uh, yeah. over well, basically, uh, it, it's as they're saying, Rolly's Boy is the first and only role playing game only convention in Portugal. It's born out the massive effort of a bunch of extraordinary fans. It's also super free. Uh, and it's also in Lisbon, which is why people are still annoying me because I had to miss the first one because I was LARPing in the UK and it won't let it go, will you, Mariano? I know it. I saw you in the chat. Anyway, um, that's also a bit of the problem because board games have become incredibly po uh, popular in Portugal, which means role-playing games are slowly being pushed away. So, for example, the big convention in, in Porto in the north is in Victorcon. And it started with quite a lot of role play and a lot of board games. But lately, like, there has been this certain, okay, yeah, role play is an afterthought. And for the longest time, especially in the early 2000s, most find that you wouldn't find many other tables. The only other table you find would be uh, Ricard Cava trying to look, guys, there's other stuff other than D20. And like this year in, in Forbidden, well, no, not Forbidden Planet, sorry, in, uh, um, in Victicon, uh, actually, we were told early on, there's not, we don't have spare tables for role play. We're not going to have any role play this year. And they just changed their mind very, very at the 11th hour. Um, however, like I said, there's nothing like Holish Boy because Holish Boy is pure role play only. And d d is just one of the games in display as far as I know. So that for me is an extraordinary thing because I've been playing since 97 and there hadn't ever been an invention. However, however, there were very small conventions, like almost meets, but if I had to choose what I would like to see coming back would be the the d d day, which is where we take d d and we run D&D, &D, but with every other system except D&D. &D. So, turns out, Buff Vampire Slay RPG, which is based on cinematic version of the Unis system, works oh. incredibly well for combat. It is really good. Like, the Pathfinder people were flabbergasted because it works so good for combat. We actually had a moment where someone tossed the dwarf that was dual yielding uh, two axes and they just decapitated a vampire or something. It was really good fun. And turns out that Neverwinter Nights, by way of Prime Minister's action, creates some interesting uh, 
place to play. It's really fun because you hard drum because of personal needs and a prejudice against elves and you don't actually can't go into the dungeons and it's still great fun. So I still desperately want to try and convince people to do again a D- and not D and D day for people like me to have a bit of a taste of they can still play what they love, but there are other things out there. Question, uh, it's not based on anything actually planned or, or happening, but I'm just thinking of a question I was asked last year. Uh, let's say the personality of Dungeons and Dragons wanted to have a D&D Euro Tour stop in Portugal. Where would be the best place to do so? Polish mm. I suppose. I mean, I don't this know. Were, uh, is there a specific shop there or something like that? It's more like where most people, and if they, if they want to do a stop, it's, yeah, uh, it's where they're more likely to have people interested. Then again, I don't know what uh, DD planet like because I do not follow D and D, but I'm going to guess. And if they can f- go to Holzboa, that actually would be really nice because it would give more coverage to uh, to the convention, and they only deserve it. It's often difficult to sadly. <laughs> That's the advice I give to convention that it's often difficult with scheduling. Uh, Daniel, Andre, anything to add in terms of conventions? Well, I mean, uh, everything ahead. has already been uh, laid out. Rolisbo is the only convention in Portugal that is solely focused on role-playing games. And in the previous edition, the last year's edition, where I, uh, I, uh, where I attended for the very first time, and it was amazing, um, uh, Andre, Andre, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I believe that uh, Dungeons and Dragons wasn't the main gameplay there. There was a lot of witty stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I can actually, uh, since since uh, I'm like uh, the founder or uh, one of the founders from Holy, uh, of Lisboa, I have uh, two things to say. So before Lisboa, there was like uh, in Lisbon, like uh, in Porto or at the north, um, the role playing community uh, who went to Lisboa Con, which is the convention of role playing of uh, board games. And there was a space for role playing, the role playing community. And um, it was the, the, the event, the convention, where he, everyone meets and starts playing and uh, shares stories and whatever. Um, in the last year, or in the last two years, uh, LishboaCon had some issues, uh, and um, last year there wasn't a LishboaCon, um, and we, the replay community, started to feel we need to have our own space. So, it's a crazy story. It's uh, end of November, uh, so uh, Nuno, which you know, Nuno Teixeira, asks me and uh, our friend... Sorry, Nuno no, from the London RPG community. For yes, know it. yes. He asks me, um, oh, can we arrange something with a stream uh, for uh, our show? He, 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 has a, he has a beautiful show. The, um, oh, damn, now I forgot. This, the streaming show. Help me, Nuno. Well, he has a streaming show. And which... Counter Roleplay, I mean, he's on many of them. No, uh, before... For some reason, he's invited, but I'm, I am never invited. Professional Last Rollers? Professional Last Rollers, thank okay, you. Yes. Cool. Yeah, he had a sh- his own show uh, with his own players. Uh, Portuguese players spread around the world playing uh, Dungeons and Dragons. And um, he asked me and Bruno from Call Initiative if we could m- arrange a small event, something for uh, the Professional Last Rollers followers and uh, f- uh, uh, like a streaming event. So what happens? Uh, me and Bruno really work well together, and uh, we challenge our ourselves, and uh, we say, "Well, mm, let's make a convention. Let's make like the first shot." And in one month, we arrange a library, awesome library, which are uh, now our partners, and uh, like uh, 100 people went to the first event which we we will not be calling the first event the, the first convention it's it was Holy Boa, um 2018 it was crazy uh, 
and it was good also it was uh, <laughs> but the original plan was subverted <laughs> Nunu, uh, <laughs> Nunu was trying to make a, a small thing, and we just blew it all all out. Um, yeah, 2019, we decided to actually make a proper one. We decided to talk with the other groups uh, of role players, communities, co uh, content creators, uh, platforms, uh, shops, and um, yeah, we've managed to make College Board 2019 at the Marvilla Library, um, which is a a, a library um, that is trying really, really hard to um, make the local community uh, grow and um, is really engaging the gaming mm -hmm. aspect. They have like a video game event, uh, game jams, and uh, a lot of stuff. And uh, yeah, they hugged Polish board. This year, uh, we have uh, Dungeons and Dragons was like the least played game. And I say it pr proudly, obviously. We have a lot of indie games, some uh, Portuguese games, uh, Ars Mecanica, uh, that is being designed by uh, Rui Anselmo. We had Terra Dentro, which is like the Portuguese Dungeon World uh, by Ricardo Tavares, Jogador Sonhador. And uh, I do believe we had Daniel's game, uh, Asylum, uh, which makes people cry and go to bed with nightmares. Uh, Indeed it does. <laughs> Indeed, Indeed it does. It does. <laughs> and yeah, we had workshops making, uh, making, not painting, making your golem miniature, uh, making your own uh, cam uh, campaign map, uh, making your, your, own, your own adventure, how to plan a campaign and other stuff like that. We had a live stream uh, with a group which is called the Rock and Roll, which is, which is trying to be the Portuguese critical role. Um, they have some uh, public figures, like a very famous uh, guy uh, from the most famous uh, radio, um, which is Pedro Fernandes. And um, yeah, they the are. Voice actor. Um, yeah. Um, and they are uh, a voice actor, Kimbe, and other uh, people that work in the. Um, as a, Not as a celebrity, but as a f uh, public figure. Um, and they, they are making their own show. They will start now in February their own uh, new season. Um, and uh, yeah, they went to Hollywood. It was awesome. And uh, yes, but regarding the numbers, now this is the, this is the part that actually uh, I have to talk. It's really different from whatever you might expect because you, Spain, fr uh, France, uh, and uh, England, you guys have a big community. We have a very small, but awesome. It's awesome, but it's a small community. Uh, we don't have like 200 people in the convention. That's saying like, it's too much. <laughs> we had like a 150, maybe 170. And that's pushing, okay. Um, and, the, and from our standard, that's a lot. Like our weekly or monthly meetings uh, have 20 to 30 people when they have 30 people they are overboarding uh, overloading with it so yeah we are a really small community because of many reasons but holish is the um, is the new thing is a new uh, convention and uh, come come to holish it's, it's in october right 24th yes, and 25th 24. of october Yes, 24, 25, October 2020, um, in the same place, uh, Marvilla Library. Um, and yes, the as you know, the Portuguese don't resist to playing and playing games in English. So you don't have, you will not have a problem if you go there. <laughs> you know what? It's very tempting. I was asking Nuno about Portugal because we we were planning some holidays with uh, Pacifilia, my wife, and yeah, Portugal is on the list. Uh, it was not really October we planned for, but yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, all know. of that sounds very interesting. So she <laughs> should be listening to this later. Hello, uh, my love. Uh, so <laughs> that would be that would be very cool uh, to do uh, two things uh, at once. Uh, I had a very interesting question from uh, I'm sorry I hope I, I pronounced it correctly. How Mariano? But before that, do we have anything else to add about convention? Well, from what I know, um, 
I hopefully um, yeah. want or at least desire that uh, um, the northern community makes their uh, makes a, a, a own a RPG focused space, so I can have an excuse to go up there. <laughs> Not that I need it, but <laughs> you see. And uh, yeah, uh, our landscape here in the south, uh, like Faro and uh, Alfeira, whatever, Portimão, um, the community is really small, and I don't believe that in the near future there will uh, be having like uh, a RPG focused convention. But there's always the board games. Um, and I can say that Portuguese. The, the board gamer uh, community uh, says that Portugal has too many board game conventions. That's a thing here in Portugal. So, oh, we have too many board game conventions. Uh, and um, But it's good. It's, it, they are events, they are conventions, and the RPG community, in whatever place you are, you can bound to the board game community, board game convention, and just uh, stick with it and make it play games. That's There's a few things that are like more than a good segue. I think it's perfect to ask Mariano's question, which is what do you three think is the Mama. next step to help Mama. grow the community and share your creations with other countries? It's, it's kind of two questions, really. Mm. Um, so I'm trying to see if I understood your question correctly. It, what is the role of the community in spreading role plays created in Portugal to outside the country? Or did well, I misunderstand well, that? The, this sort of two parts of the question. The first half of, part of the question is what is the next step to grow the community within Portugal? So that's the first question. And second question is to, to be more visible abroad and share creations uh, abroad. I, I actually don't know. Here's the thing, though. Um, in general, and this is sort of connects with how Portuguese games come through. Like they're very indies. And a gamer dreamer man, I have a massive date with him because he refuses to translate his latest really good book. Like we have RP Genesis in August last year, and he created his own take to Dungeon World, and he made it really, 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 really inspired by Portuguese legends. And I kept telling him, well, you should do a, a translation that is some really good stuff. Like it, it's a really interesting take. Like he re rewrote the roles completely, the, the character sheets. And he kept saying, no, this is a game for Portugal. This is a game for Portuguese. I don't see the purpose in translating it. And I think um, that to grow the community, we would actually have to have big games, which happens in France. Like, you started in France. Yeah, at the I same did. Time as I Portugal. started. I started yeah, all of yeah. that. But the community, the community in France started at the same time as in Portugal with the, the red box. And for some reason, maybe because you're more than us, maybe because you didn't have the, the, a, det a detectorship to bring you back by about 10 to 20 years, you have big games being published. You have your own games. You have uh, Inomines, uh, uh, in, Inomines Veritas Tanis, whatever. In, in Inomines Satanis Magna Veritas. Magna Veritas, yeah. You have your own games from the very start. And that never happened in Portugal. I don't know why. It might be a social thing. So maybe it will happen in time when we start to catch up with the rest of society, when people start going, ah, I, I could actually create my own role playing game. I mean, it doesn't have to be d and it can be other. And I think that when the people that play mainly d and realize that, that's when that's going to happen. Because there's the older generation, like me and Mariano and, and Game and Dreamer Man, we already know there are other games. We engage in them constantly. But right now, um, we need to happen in France and Belgium, because I have friends from France and Belgium, so I sort of have a bit of an idea what goes on is... We need to educate them, I guess, to show them, look, you can create your own role play. You don't need to use the same role play for everything. And by the way, I'm not taking a, a pot shot at D&D, although I that all the time. I did the same. With, uh, you mentioned when people took John Wick and made him as a D&D character. I did that with World of Darkness, which was my first game. I turned everything into a storyteller system. So I'm not just because people from DDI or anything. It's just 
you cling to your mother's apron and their mother is the so I'm 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 going to be honest I don't know we also are a fairly poor country which means money for things like a convention about role playing games might not get traction might not get sponsors might not contribute so honestly if you have any good ideas I'd like to know them because I do want to help role playing game beca- role playing games become a more with spread thing in my country I mean, this is a platform for to to throw a stone in the lake, and there's little waves and so on. So people, please, I uh, will put the contact details of each of the guests here. And if you have ideas, whether or not you're from Portugal, and uh, suggestions, and um, because all of this is very exciting, please do contact them uh, to tell you about that. So Daniel, as the young kid on the block who makes weird faces when I say nomine satanis magna veritas. Uh, what's, what do you, what's your opinion on Claudia's views uh, on uh, what should happen next? Uh, wishful thinking about what should be happening with the RPG community in Portugal? I mean, uh, when it comes to creating content and uh, everything, everything else, um, that's the thing. That that's how uh, how it should be. That's what should be done in order in order to increase numbers and uh, and everything. But uh, there's the the other side of the coin that I mentioned previously. You have people that uh, try to get into the into the hobby and uh, are uh, uh, welcomed into a D and D group or are uh, shoved off by uh, by uh, some media that thinks that. Uh, other game, some games are better than others, um, and this breaks the community. And uh, other, even when you to try to aggregate people, what happens is the the niche effect, uh, because uh, there are some people that go into a Facebook group and say, "Hey, is there someone in my local area that uh, the, that is hosting a game I would like to try?" And uh, that other is, or or, or there isn't. Um, and that's the thing, they go into the group, if everything go, goes right, they stay in that group, and uh, maybe there's a chance that uh, they will welcome some, uh, somebody else, or they take the, the journey into um, uh, another, another department. Uh, if we were, we're trying to make the things uh, international or, or something, that they, uh, it will do, Need to pass through there the the, the aggregation aspect and the, the, the break the stereotype and the fear of uh, creating a, a, your your own work, your own adventure, your own game. Uh, maybe st- start like a, like I started. I, I started playing Dungeons and Dragons. I started uh, creating content for Dungeons and Dragons. I created items. I created classes, um, and uh, I slowly started getting to the realization that uh, Dungeons and Dragons isn't everything. There is Vampire the Masquerade, there is Call of Tulu, and it's because of my bad experience with Call of Tulu that I created Asylum, um, uh, and, uh, and stuff like that. And uh, maybe if someone out there creates a publishing, of course, everything would go boom with uh, all the creators that are there uh, would converge into it and get their games published in Portuguese or not. Um, and uh, until that happens, we have to settle with what we have, which are the uh, the indie platforms like each one Patreon, and maybe to, it will go some way, somewhere. I don't know. I'm wondering. So, so it's kind of a twofold question. The first question would be: uh, I'm wondering if D and D players uh, could. Uh, there's the DMs Guild, so I'm wondering if Portuguese D&D fans are or could write adventures on the DMs Guild in English or even in Portuguese. And oh, uh, and the second question uh, related to that, or well, it's, it's more uh, general thinking than a question, is uh, as a, a foreigner to to Portugal, uh, are there any kind of uh, what's the word? Um, Osmosis exchanges between Portugal and Brazil, which seem to be a much larger market in terms of 
the number of copies or whatever you're doing uh, that you would do uh, who happens to to be speaking portuguese okay so the first question as far as i know there are multiple members of that guild and that they regularly publish i think there is a portuguese girl who is involved in one of these D, &D workshop courses where you learn how to write things uh Beatrice. where you, how to write adventures yeah what's um, her name you said sorry Beatrice Dias. She works uh, a lot with Travis Lega. Um, cool. Yeah, from Scarlet Lands and stuff like yeah. that. So as as for the second, look, it's been twenty years to try to put the translated Vampire the Masquerade in Portugal. We're still taking the piss from the, their translations of the distance. So I don't think it's ever going to happen. Like we've said before, we were incredibly resistant to translated stuff. So I, I'm not seeing the Osmo. I mean, I will give you a thing. Brazilian um, role players are now putting out some really good games of their own, like based on their own culture and not just being a replica of what's already out there. Because I do know that they had some really popular uh, fantasy games, fantasy RPGs that never ever came to Portugal because we didn't want them. We, we didn't see any value, as far as I could tell, in them because we go, look, if we want to play this Heartbreaker D&D &D game, we'll just go play in D&D, &D. Uh, even though they were massively popular in Brazil. But now, like, they're now their own projects, their own things. So whereas I don't think any time soon we're going to take their translations, I think that some of their projects are getting at least a couple of people here. I know uh, Gamer Dreamer Man has been regularly following the scene and buying their stuff. I know Mariano also buys some of their stuff, as far as I know. So, yeah, it might come some things not because we have a common language, although that helps, but more like because they're putting out some really interesting things. They're putting out fantasy-based instead of traditional English fantasy based off their own in indigenous fantasy so it just for the novelty of it for the ability to widen people's horizons and discover interesting things that's where as most has come from Rao is uh, clarifying that uh, it's actually very expensive to import and export uh, products between Brazil and Portugal since uh, there's no trade agreement yeah. uh, that I'm aware of. And speaking of trade agreement and the news and all of that which fills us with joy, uh, I've got reports of Britain stranded in Algarve who are very motivated <laughs> to support the RPG community. So uh, El Cid is commenting that in the chat room. So yeah, please uh, Dear Britons abroad, uh, get in touch with our guests uh, to support uh, anything going on. Andre, did our last question inspire you in anything? Well, regarding the DMs Guild, yes, we, we do have uh, some people that uh, do some titles. Uh, being the most established author, Beatrice Diaz, she is awesome. We've, uh, I actually uh, met her almost by accident regarding Paul Lisboa. She volunteered for Paul Lisboa. Without, uh, yeah, yeah, she volunteered. She was the the the, the blonde girl on the the main the main uh, on the reception, and that's crazy. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that's oh. crazy. She's like the most established, uh, probably Portuguese author uh, on uh, DMs Guild, and oh, uh, no one knew that she uh, that she writes stuff. And somehow, in a casual conversation, I found out, and I said, "What are you doing here? You were." You are the perfect uh, person to make a workshop. We are. You are the more experienced of all of us. And she, ah. <laughs> she's, really, <laughs> she's really shy. shy. And uh, yes, yeah, she's the most established uh, uh, Portuguese author that I know, and probably uh, uh, it is um, in Dems Guild. I've tried. I've made my shot uh, last year. I've made uh, Wedding Lights, uh, an adventure inspired by a Portuguese legend, the Portuguese of uh, Princess, uh, Princess Fatima or Princess Oriana. Um, and um, yeah, it's there. It's available for everyone who wants to run uh, something inspired by a Portuguese legend. Um, and yeah, I do believe there is a supplement that uh, another Portuguese 
outdoor may uh, road uh, it's like uh, subclasses or something like that but i don't know for sure who, who she is and what are their uh, her titles um, it's very tempting hearing you uh back what started the release present was a panel about tabletop role playing games in the uk and ireland and at the time my guest who i picked to represent dungeons and dragons sort of she was not able to make it so i made a second panel just about dungeons and dragons in the uk and ireland uh, hearing you and since uh you, you know, we always have this debate, D&D &D and the other games. Uh, I think yeah, I could run maybe later a D strictly Dungeons and Dragons in Portugal. That could be interesting with uh, all the amazing people you are, you are naming. Um, I think we're going to move uh, to the goodbyes and the plugs, unless anyone's got anything to add. No? Oh, no, no. Let's go. Yep, yep. Go ahead, Claudia. No, no, I was saying that. I'm good. Go, go, go for it. Shall I make my plug? No, wait. Uh, well, yes. Uh, but the second, uh, I just wanted to say from what you described, I will ha make a personal plea to a humble plea to gamer, dreamer, man, to please translate his work to English because I'm personally someone who would really, I'm, I mean, there's the Aswing projects uh, for internet. Uh, if, I'm not confusing horribly things. Uh, I think it's a role-playing game uh, in the Philippines with the local culture in the game. I'm uh, stuff like um, Aquelare for Spain. I'm a big uh, a person very interested in having role-playing games, which tells a, a bit of something different, something abroad. And I think we should have as many of these as possible. I'd like to see these from you. All the countries in Europe, I see, see that from countries from Africa, India, the Middle East, uh, the, the Far East, the Japanese games. I think all of those role playing games are a very unique way to engage with a culture. It might be flawed, but then what is not flawed? I think it's much more deep and interesting than, let's say, a movie. So uh, I would really hope that Gamer Dreamer Man would consider translating his work and maybe again joining us uh, in Dragon Meat. On that, Claudia, please could you say your goodbye and tell to people where they can find you and plug anything you have to plug away. Okay, so uh, I don't have a logo you follow me as I do the and I don't have a, a media personality I'm crotchety little bitch. Oh, sorry, I can't say bitch, can I? Uh, <clears throat> anyway. A bitch uh, is a Portuguese uh, yeah. word. To, to, um, it's, it's a little lamb. <laughs> it's a if, if you're in, um, I'm mostly in, um, in the Portuguese Discord channel because I have minutes. Uh, you're welcome to come to RP Genesis every year in, in August where we for seven months of day we create an RPG from scratch. Um, or if you're in the UK and you like LARPing and you're into Warhammer 40k, I, uh, I'm one of the head writers from Death Unto Darkness, which runs two events per year we were with like literally coming out of a break. the next event is in july i believe and that, the other one i think it's october so if that's your cup of tea you're welcome to come either as a player or if you want to just try it out we always need to, which means we will give you really interesting npcs to play and treat you like gold as far as we're concerned because we do rely a lot on our wonderful wonderful crew to stab our players very safely but stab them constantly yeah so bye guys it was a pleasure to be here thank you so much for having me thank you so much for joining i mean it was amazing andre okay so you can find me at scumbag dm although i'm not that scumbag <laughs> <laughs> over at twitter and instagram the same tag um you can find uh, my independent publisher at itchio uh, maria basha maria basha um, itchio uh, i've released small games uh, being the most the last one the most famous the orc and the pie uh, a game inspired by the mount cook uh, dnd post uh, on 22 uh, i believe 2002 uh, regarding an, uh, the smallest adventures ever um and uh, yeah, you can find me also at the uh, Roll Initiative uh, Twitch channel. And uh, at this very moment, I am 
uh, getting ready um, soon to be Kickstarter project. Uh, Dirty Town, a uh, role-playing game about the corny adventures of pigeons in, in Dirty Town. In English? Uh, yes, yes, it will be in English. It's for the Zine Quest 2, the Lucrane uh, Zine thing uh, over at Kickstarter, and it will be launched mid-February to late, late February. We are still managing that stuff, and uh, yeah, stay tuned on it. Also, Ooh. Callum, an invite, not an invite, uh, I'm inviting myself to, uh, I have a, a French game. I went to France. To my place on your coach, what? <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait. I, I went to France, I have a French game, which is Te Deum Pour Un Massacre. Oh. And I don't know how to read or speak French. So <laughs> I want to play this game. Please master it. Okay. So Te Deum Pour Un Massacre. I don't know how to read it because it's literally the format of one of those uh, Bibles, you know, for uh, yeah, uh, myself. It's, it's a huge game by uh, Jean-Philippe Jaworski, who is also a novelist. Uh, he wrote something which is called Gagner la Guerre, which is kind of the, uh, I would call it the French uh, Song of Ice and Fire. Uh, I really want to do an episode about this game, but I'm struggling to find a game master. I got the game, but it's... It's a big game, a very serious it's game about the Sin Bartholomew massacre, very precise, very extensive into yeah. historical features. So it's a, it's a, it's a steep uh, slope to climb. But yeah, we'll, we'll be in touch uh, about that. Daniel, <laughs> you're closer. Well, you can find me uh, in my Facebook at uh, Daniel Carvalho. Uh, you can ask me uh, any sort of questions about everything, uh, creative writing, creating RPGs, uh, uh, insulting me for uh, taking uh, uh, taking hours of your sleep by playing my games. And um, uh, when it comes to games, you can find them at uh, uh, at my itch.io page at one uh, dm3. Uh, my games are both in Portuguese and in English. Um, uh, and you can also find me on my Patreon, uh, Font Stories, um, and also through uh, Hall Initiative, uh, both into Facebook and uh, and Patreon. And that's it. I uh, appreciate the invitation to be part of this podcast, and I hope that my contribu contribution was uh, at least useful and enlightening in some way. I mean, I I'm extremely happy uh, about this panel. I thought it was very interesting. Uh, your your input, uh, the three of you about Portugal was fascinating. I don't remember which one of you actually reached me out, uh, suggested the idea for uh, for this panel. Was it Andre? Was it... No? I believe no, it, it was, was Daniel. It was Daniel. I mean, that was amazing. And uh, if uh, there are people out there from uh, anywhere across Europe who, who want to come forward to suggest uh, panels, I would love uh, to have them, uh, please do get in touch with me. Sometimes it takes time. It took time to for this one to happen. Yeah. It was delayed a couple of times, but th that's the way things go. But uh, when it happened, it's amazing. Uh, all those things which were mentioned, and maybe not everything, everything, but as many as possible, I will try to put links in the description of this episode. So if you're listening to that or watching it on YouTube, do click or come to our website to find those details. Uh, in those details, you will find a way to support the Rollist or the RPG Academy via Patreon. Uh, we do that out of our love for the RB, but we do have expense. And uh, more importantly, your support through Patreon allows us to do more things. Uh, I take advantage of personal trips sometimes to record abroad. I recently, well, not that recently, recorded in a game shop in France. I look forward to releasing that. But uh, yeah, if I, had, if I had more support on Patreon, I would more easily consider go to Rollisboa, for instance, or Luca, or Essen, or God knows where. I mean, I'm so thankful for every penny of the 24 pounds I get per month. But uh, if you like the show and you'd like more content of it, please support us via Patreon because uh, literally every penny you put in there, I'm put into creating content for you and the community. And it goes the same for the RPG. Academy. I was Kaloum. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, see you soon. I don't know what the next panel is going to be about, but uh, I got some leads. So hopefully see you next month. And uh, in the meantime, have good games. 